Welcome back. You're watching Stockwatch uh, with me, Zanati Kuma, and joining me to take your stock-related questions tonight are Shane Watkins from All Weather Capital and Rikas Riedis from PSG Wealth Reimsich. Uh, be sure to send your questions on email at stockwatch at bdtv.co.za or via SMS on 41392 or on X using the hashtag Stockwatch. Thank you so much for your time, gents. Um, it's been quite an interesting day because... It, particularly in the U.S., it seems to have broken the trend uh, that we have seen. Well, I guess the Dow really has broken the trend because it was a case of the S&P and the Nasdaq um, are under pressure, but the Dow um, was actually trading in the green, kind of seeing the sector rotation. But even the Dow today is under pressure. Rikas, what is dampening the market's mood? Because even the JSC was down under today. I think uh, apart from the normal economic noise, whether it be the... Um ECB's interest rates and inflation, all those things. At the moment, it's geopolitical uncertainty. Um, and there's what I can perceive a general risk of um, associated with markets, whether it be America, whether it be local, whether it be in Europe. People are just worried about um, the um, very real effects of um, the USA's political situation. Hmm. Well, it's actually quite interesting uh, because obviously one of the sectors um, where there's nervousness on a geopolitical tensions is the semiconductor uh, 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 sector, which is actually quite interesting because ASML came out with uh, results uh, yesterday and TSMC uh, today and beating forecasts. But uh, Shane, I mean, do you think that... Um, the geopolitical tensions are maybe not worth you leaving uh, that sector when these companies are still producing good results, or is there something? Is it something that you actually need to consider if you do want to get into that sector? So, Nati, there have been two major political events that have been taking place simultaneously. The one is the Republican National Convention, and the other is a thing called the Chinese Communist Party Third Plenum. And um, literally, when I say simultaneously, um, literally at the, the, on the same day, at the same hour. Um, and in terms of the Republican National Convention, Donald Trump and his vice president, have, J.D. Vance, have come out very much against big tech. Uh, and, they've, and they've come out against, um, essentially, the, the, the Magnificent Seven, if you want to call them. Um, and the concern is that the... The, 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 the almost the multi-decade period that we've had where big tech has outperformed everything else. I mean, I think something like 80% of the S&P 500 is flat or down. Mm -hmm. It's only the large cap tech stocks that are up. And Donald Trump and J.D. Vance have come out against big tech, saying that they're too powerful, they have a corrosive effect on society, uh, they need to be regulated, they need to be taxed properly, and so on. So there's been a rotation in the United States out of these large cap growth shares into smaller cap value shares. And of course, you know, these large cap growth shares have low tax rates and low debt. Um, and tax rates are going to come down under Donald Trump. So that will benefit companies that are smaller with higher tax rates. And it will benefit companies that actually have debt, which will be the smaller stock. So as I said, in the States, rotation out of large cap growth into small cap value. Uh, in terms of the Chinese Communist Party Third Plenum, um, people have been looking at that to see how the Chinese Communist Party chart the course for the next five years in terms of the economic policy against the United States. And at 7 p.m. SA time, there's a news conference, and we'll hear more about that. But the news flow so far has not been particularly reassuring. Yeah. In other words, you know, there's been something of a leap uh, 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 a more anti-capitalist tone coming out of the CCP, or at least not positive news. Uh, so I guess it's a lack of positive news out of the CCP, and it's kind of negative news for the large cap tech coming out of the Republican National Convention. Hmm. Rikas, I know you've been very cautious about um, Chinese, um, you know, focused stocks because of the kind of uh, political regulatory landscape. Does this make you more nervous, these geopolitical tensions that are happening right now? It doesn't change my mind. I mean, um, never mind the, the Chinese Communist Party, which is effectively just Xi Jinping. And um, yesterday, he basically repeated what he's been saying the whole time. So there's no um, 
wonderful plan coming from him. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen tonight, but the third plenum is normally where the um, um, where the Chinese authorities will um, announce big news, and so far nothing. So China is just doddering on the way it is. Um, in the meantime, Biden is trying. Biden is trying to outdo Donald Trump as far as possible um, sanctions and restrictions um, for the export of uh, microchip technology to, um, to China is concerned. That adds to Trump's negative um, feeling about that sector in general. So, um, yeah, as, <laughs> as Shane said, mm. um, apart from the, from, from the politics, the yeah. effect of what they are saying is weighing on the market. Mm, or... And Aunty, maybe also just to add to what Trikasa says, yeah. there's probably only one thing that the Democrats and the Republicans agree on, mm. and that is that they hate China. <laughs> yeah. it is a, it, it, this is kind of tails you win, hedge, t tails you lose, heads you lose, um, mm. from a Chinese perspective in terms of who gets into the White House. There will be some kind of clampdown on the import of Chinese goods. And, you know, the Chinese strategy at the present moment is to, is to kind of, it's an export-driven strategy. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, Donald Trump has said that perhaps we should tax all goods coming into the United States out of China at 60%. Now, Goldman Sachs estimates that that will cut 2.5% of Chinese GDP growth. Mm. And, you know, China is, let's call it, 20% of the world economy. So, you know, these trade wars have a negative effect on economic growth. Mm, all right. And eventually uh, stocks. Uh, thank you so much for that insight, Jen. So let's get to the questions. Um, yeah, while we're talking about uh, the uh, U.S. stocks, uh, I'm 55 uh, years old with 750,000 uh, rand to invest for five years and would like to know uh, from the panel which of the two vehicles would they recommend? Should I go for an annual 12.02% from one of the major banks on a five-year fixed deposit at maturity or the S&P 500? Rikas? Five years <clears throat> is not really a very, very long term. So um, I would tend to um, suggest a strategy of both. In other words, put on a... Um, on an income-bearing investment, that which you will definitely need. And then you can take a position in equity with what remains. Whether that should be the S&P 500 um, for the next five years, who knows? Could do very well. But we, you know, if we just take a look today, mm. a lot of what's happening in the S&P over the past year, two years, has been driven by five or six stocks. So maybe the S&P... Um, is not the correct American vehicle to go to go into. Um, again, it's it's always diversification. At the moment, the S and P is not a diversified index. Hmm. Okay, quite interesting. Um, yeah, five year uh, fixed deposit at uh, maturity. Uh, Shane or S and P five hundred. Ricker says maybe both, but also maybe uh, not the S and P five hundred. <laughs> Um, so, Nati, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm a fund manager, but I would say that when you're 55, I guess capital preservation has got to be one of the things you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, younger people would take more risk, older people would take less risk. Um, you know, the Saab um, uh, meeting was today, and the reason I bring that up is if you're earning 12% yeah. and inflation is 4 and a half, you're earning, let's call it 6.5% uh, real, that must be one of the highest real interest rates in the world. 6.5% real is extremely attractive. There's almost nothing that can beat 6.5% real. So um, I would say, um, you know, if you can really earn 6.5% real mm -hmm. for five years, that's a pretty good bet. Ah, all right. Well, I mean, if, if uh, Rikas, I know you may be saying not S&P 500, but if... Uh, the viewer really wants to go for the S&P 500. Uh, which would you recommend between Satrix, uh, Satrix and Vanguard? Um, well, they basically marry, marry each other because doesn't there's a currency difference. Um, which yeah. specific band is this an offshore Vanguard fund or or a local Vanguard fund? Uh, I'm actually not sure. They didn't say. 
Well, if it's S and P five hundred, it's S and P five hundred. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Rikas. Um, yeah, as I said, if it's the um, if what you're investing in is the S and P five hundred, there might be a RAND differential depending on what the ETF um, price is quoted at. But in the end, mm. it is it is the S and P five hundred. Ah, just like right. a, just compare the costs of the two funds, basically. Ah, okay. Ah, uh, all right. Uh, well, gents, let's get on to the next uh, question. And uh, this is on uh, pick and pay. I uh, want to establish what pick and pay is worth without Boxer. Shane, is this a, a, an easy one or a difficult one <laughs> to ascertain? So, um, yeah, well, uh, it's relatively easy because, um, you know, let's say Boxer is worth 20 billion, which I think is the rough consensus number um, that the investment banks have. Um, you know, pre the rights issue, let's say, because we don't want to complicate things with the, the share trading X rights. Yeah. But pre the rights issue, um, you know, the company was worth uh, less than that. So you were getting essentially um, the rest of pick and pay for free. And, and what would that be? That would be, um, let's call it uh, 400 corporate stores, 400 franchise stores, uh, some clothing stores, some liquor stores. Um, you're getting that for nothing. The reason you're getting it for nothing is because it's making losses. So the bet that you're taking is that the new management team under Sean Summers can turn it around. And my judgment would be that he can turn it around. So I think it is worth something. So, um, you know, I think uh, you're kind of paying for Boxer and you're getting a free option on the pick and pay corporate and franchise business. Hmm. Well, well, I mean, uh, the, the second part of the, the question is, uh, is the unbundling of boxes still on the cards? I've not read anything to the contrary in the media. Yes, it is it's still on the cards. Um, Rikas, what would you make? So that's not 100% right. Oh. They're not going to unbundle it. They're going to sell they, They're going to sell off 30% of it and it will okay. be separately listed. Yes. But the controlling shell, in other words, pick and pay will still own 70% of boxer and 30% will be in public hands. Yeah. Ah, all right, all right. I hear you on that. Um, Rikas, uh, on your side, uh, pick and pay and the box unlisting, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I completely or agree with Shane. You're basically, you're basically getting a bunch of loss-making loss assets for nothing. But there is a chance of turning that around, but it, or some of it around, even if you've got to rid, in the end, get rid of things which continue to, to make a loss. And then... And then it's worth something. So you go from zero to something. And I think Sean, Sean Summers, from a managerial standpoint, well, if you can't do it, there's, I can't think of any, anybody else that's going to be able to do that. You know, I was just thinking right now, if you compare it with somebody like Spar, which also got into deep trouble, if I can call mm -hmm. it that. You know, there, there it's different. There you've got a... You've got to guess about, you know, how much profit they're going to make, how much losses, how much do they have to expense still. So, so there's an argument to be had about what, for example, Spar, which is in a, I won't say similar, but, but, yeah. but also under stress. Whereas with pick and pay, you're getting something for nothing. So, so any gain, um, you can see how the, how the gearing would work on the share price if only some of those things really turn around. Uh, all right. There is a question on uh, Amplats. The viewer remembers you picking Amplats as your stock pick on the 16th of May. Uh, and basically, they want uh, your uh, opinion on it right now. And I guess particularly with the numbers that came out today. So, uh, Anarchy, I would say Amplats came out with fairly good numbers, uh, a little bit better than what the market was expecting. Um, and you know, look, the, the thing for all of the PGM companies is the platinum and the palladium price have had significant declines over the past six or 12 months. Um, those prices appear to have stabilized. The one thing about Amplats is that it's got quite a strong balance sheet, so it's likely to survive, unlike you know some of the other more um, balance sheet stretch PGM mm. players. The difficulty that Amplats has, of course, is that it's going to be unbundled um, in Anglo-Americans' own strategy. And that may, you know, result in some something of an overhang of the shares. But, you know, if you want to say from a trading perspective, I think the results were a bit better than expected. There's a huge short base in Amplats. And those shorts will eventually have to cover. 
And I think, I mean, I think it closed around 640 Rand today. I think this is a, probably a pretty good level to be entering. Ah, okay. uh, of course, okay. the, the proviso being that the palladium price doesn't fall much below $900 and the platinum price stays at $1,000. Ah. Rikas, would you be brave enough to enter right now? No, no. As, as um, Shane said, the, uh, the platinum group metals m prices must behave themselves. And at the moment, I... They might be base building, but there's no sizzle in it at the moment. And until such time as those start running, um, you might be buying amplets at below, you know, fair value, which is great. But then you've got to sit with it and 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 wait for um, the stars to align. Um, I'd rather wait to, to, to see that scenario start. Um, and then buy in, then sort effectively with hmm. something that's just going sideways. Ah, all right. Well, let's stick to uh, commodities. Um, please help me understand why Exaro is nearing its former highs of 2022 and 2023. While Tingela is down in the doldrums again, as surely their share prices are both uh, largely linked to the coal commodity cycles and prices. And if I were to add a coal commodity play uh, to my portfolio, which of these two would you pick? Uh, Exaro at a high price or Tungela at a low price? So that's a very interesting question. Exaro versus Tungela, Shane. So, Nati, um, the difference between these two companies is they both uh, uh, have an export coal business. Um, Exaro just has a stake in the Sishan Iron Ore Company uh, as well, which is larger than their coal business. Okay. So, um, Tungela actually has a bigger coal business. I think Tungela exports about 12 million tons and Exara is about 8.5 or 9 million tons. Um, so, w what I'm getting at is that when you buy Exara, you're essentially buying Kumba as well okay. and a more dominant part of the portfolio. If you just want to bet on export thermal coal, then you must buy Tungela. Um, I think it's worth noting that they estimate that last year, 50 million tons of coal and iron ore didn't get exported because of inefficiencies on the Transnet rail lines. So, you know, with the, the, the new government of national unity and the apparent better economic plan for our country, I think you will see uh, better export volumes of iron ore and coal um, this year, later this year, next year. And that should be good for both companies. But if you want to play coal, then Tungela is your play because Exora has got this iron ore business added to it. And iron ore, I think, is going to go through some tough times for the reason that 75% of seaborne iron ore goes to China. And about a third of that goes into housing. And that residential housing market is dead. So I think there's significant headwinds facing iron ore. Um, Hmm. So probably if I had to choose between the two, I'd choose uh, Tungela. Ah, yeah. And I mean, even Kumba today did cite uh, a significant pullback in the iron ore market. Um, Rikas, where would you be? Iron ore versus coal at this point? I think um, Sean touched on a very important point that the one thing that can benefit both of these companies is um, an increase in export capability, and that would present a trading opportunity, in other words, which would make the um, the business of both of them, being iron ore and coal mining, um, and how the company is positioned in relation to that, from very bad to bad, because the, the more pressing problem is what is happening with the coal market, and specifically what is happening with the iron market. So you'll get a price rally because of operational efficiency, but the stuff they sell is not in demand at the moment. Um, so Tungela has been underperforming Exaro for the past two years, and that doesn't seem to be um, to be changing at all. Of course, if if the exports get better, then um, you know at least you're only dealing dealing with one thing. So I wouldn't really be doing a either or. But I agree with um, Shane that I would rather be in a single commodity, but I would wait for the Tungela price to actually start outperforming Exara before I make that decision. Ah, all right. Um, 
Shane, I actually want to come to you because um, the viewer also uh, posted a question on Data Tech asking you um, to explain your rationale for the pick as, as you have had it as a stock pick, what you expect uh, to be a catalyst to close the gap between current NAV and share price. So the thing about Data Tech is it's listed on the JSE, but 100% of its operations are outside of South Africa. So it's essentially a dollar earner. Now the RAND has strengthened from call it 1950 to 1820 uh, against the dollar. And obviously that is a headwind for a company like Data Tech. I think the catalyst for Data Tech, the ultimate, um, Data Tech was previously four businesses. Um, they sold off two of the businesses and they are left with two businesses. And I think ultimately the catalyst for Data Tech is a breakup of the company or the company going private. I think Jens Montanana has alluded to the fact that he wants to do a value unlock. They have appointed an investment bank to look at how they could do that. Uh, but he said he wants to get both businesses, you know, uh, essentially both of the businesses performing very well before he sells them. It's just a question of timing. Um, I think, if, you know, if you look at where he is in his life, he's kind of, I guess, around 60 years old. Um, you know, he, he wants to crystallize that value for himself as well. So I think it's essentially a corporate activity play dependent on Jens. And I think if we're fair to him, he's done a pretty good job unlocking value and doing good transactions up until now. So, you know, it's essentially a corporate activity event. You can't predict the timing. Um, but a strong RAND is not a good thing for data tech. Mm, all right. Um, Rikas, uh, just before we get to your stock picks, I quickly want to come to you uh, back to commodities, Glencore. Um, why is Glencore down so much when mining stocks are generally uh, up? I think that was maybe a one day or two day move um, on the mining stocks being up. Uh, yeah, just your thoughts on uh, how Glencore has been performing? Depending on, um, I didn't check the price today mm. or yesterday, but. Um, if memory serves correctly over the past week, basically um, all the big mining houses locally listed, whether it be Anglis, Billiton, and Lincoln, have, um, have moved in conjunction with what hap with what's happening with commodity prices on a day to day basis, but but more so on the strengthening of the rand. So I didn't notice a particular underperformance from Glencore mm. um, over the past day or two. Yeah, on your side, Jane. Um, you know, look, I think that the, the commodity shares are driven by global growth expectations. And I think, you know, we have seen a slowing of the, the, of the global economy. Um, we're at the top of the rate cycle. Um, if the dollar starts to weaken, that will definitely be good for the commodity shares. Um, but at the present moment, you know, as Rikas has said, I mean, we've got slowing growth in uh, we're slowing demand, let's at least say, for the PGMs, for the iron ore companies. Um, the copper price came off about 8% the other day. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the news flow around commodities just hasn't been that great of late. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, and the RAND has been quite strong. And those two things together are negative for commodity shares. Uh, all right. Well, let's get on to more uh, positive uh, sentiment. Your stock picks for today, gents. Rikas, so what are you picking? It's a um, logistics company, FedEx, based on what's happening with the American freight, freight market, which seems to be coming out of uh, what has been a deep recession. They will benefit from that. Um, secondly, the, only about 10% of FedEx's business at the moment is heavy freight. They're expanding into uh, Mexico and the United States. With all these trade barriers going up um, from America's side, the hip and the inshoring happening, Mexico and Canada um, are great destinations if you are doing freight because that's where the inshoring is happening and it benefits um, FedEx, a small part of the business at the moment, it gives them that little growth factor and the growth looks nice <laughs> all right well uh, what looks nice to you at the moment shane <laughs> so Nati, i think we are positive on south african uh, stocks uh you know south africa's had a number of years where we've had uh foreign outflows and i think we you know with the government of national unity better economic growth better management and oversight uh we're likely to see inflows and so you know 
we, as I said, we like domestic SA, the financials and the industrials. And of the financials, my top pick would be ABSA. I almost want to say um, it's the ugliest house on the best street. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it trades extremely cheaply. It's trading at 0.9 times book value, a 9% dividend yield of 5.5 PE. Uh, I think Ari Rotenbach, who's been there as a CEO for two and a half years, no doubt he must be feeling the pressure and aware that investors are fatigued by a series of disappointments. Mm. But, you know, one thing I've learned over 30 years in the stock market is that if you buy banks below book value and you're patient and they don't go under, you will make money. And so, you know, yeah, you're buying this bank uh, 0.9 times book value. I mean, for context, Capitec, which is an extremely good bank, trades on 6.5 or 7 times book value. I know you can't compare them. Mm. And I mean, just by the way, Capitec's worth more than APSA and NetBank combined now. But I think APSA's worth a stab here. Um, as I say, um, you know, just simply too cheap, 5.5 forward PE. Mm, all right. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your analysis today, gents. Much appreciated. That is all for tonight's Stock Watch. Thanks to our guests, Shane Watkins from All Weather Capital and Rikas Riedis from a PSG uh, Wealth Hole in One uh, Reimsuch. Uh, up next, the close. Stay tuned. <laughs>